Good morning, everybody. Let's stand and worship together. Nothing is 
all of us will reach a crossroads in life, a decision that has to be made. Some can be small and insignificant. Others seem like they could shape the course of our entire lives. How can we know the will of God? How can we correctly choose the path he has set out for us? And what if we make the wrong decision? We spend sleepless nights and days filled with anxiety when we place these burdens upon ourselves. Often we become isolated, feeling completely alone in finding the right answer. Sometimes we're tempted to rush into a decision. Other times we'd rather delay indefinitely. But for those who call him Father, for those who believe in the power of his name, he provides everything we need to follow his will. He gives us his word as a compass and inspiration. Those who live according to scripture will always follow in his footsteps. He blesses us with wise counsel through his church and the leaders he has set in place. He hears our every prayer, granting peace and wisdom to those who ask. His very spirit dwells in us, a still small voice that guides from within our hearts. And in his perfect timing, he will open doors. He will clear the way forward. And no matter the path you choose, you are never alone. He will walk beside you and enfold you with his love from now until the end of eternity. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. seek to know and follow God's will for our life. May this next song be our prayer. I just invite you to stand as we continue to worship together.
just thank the adults that went to us. Went with us to children's camp this week. Um, Miss Marianne made that possible. She set up so much uh, of all the things that had to be done for us to go. Uh, Joyce kind of took that baton, and then we had some others, Tommy, uh, Lynn, Sandra, Valerie, and, of course, I was there. And uh, I, I, I wanted to just say a couple things before I uh, sit down because I'm not preaching today. Um, I took the week and invested in your kids as I've been doing for a number of years. And um, I don't regret that one bit because I got to know some of them a little bit better, like Trent. Amen, Trent? Trent and I were in the finals of the card playoff, and uh, we won't talk about who won, but anyway, so it was a good time. Um, I want to recognize also uh, a, a new pair of friends, uh, Stanley and Jennifer. Just kind of wave at us. Uh, they they kept your kids safe on the bus and uh, he drove us there he wasn't just a bus driver he was our friend and and we've got a new relationship with him and uh, he he's also a pastor and he's pastoring over in franklin am i right and uh he came early this morning to be with us and and he's going to go back and be with his church in a little bit so I want you to get to know them. If they step out early, uh, it's because he's got responsibilities today. And uh, he, he told me he took another trip last night, didn't get home to 2 o'clock this morning, uh, got some quick rest, and he's here to worship with us. And then he's going to go preach. And so, you know, you can drive our bus anywhere, brother, and I appreciate that. I want to pray for Mark. Mark has been gracious to fill in for me today. To allow me to be able to do that with the kids and so let me pray for mark before he comes to speak father i'm so grateful lord that you let us know you and you give us opportunity to grow in that relationship lord uh, I, I thank you for the camp experience that we've had again this year the fact that our boys and girls were challenged with the gospel and not just them but the adults as well uh, for us to hear it one more time in a, in a great way and in a special way so that, Lord, we can be sure of our salvation. We can be sure of, of our obedience. We can be faithful to grow and become all that you want us to be. I thank you for the experience we've had this week. It's been good to be with you and to be with each other. Thank you for allowing us to have camp this year. Thank you, Lord. I pray for Mark. God bless him. I know he's prepared and I know he's asked you for a word today and I ask that God you speak mightily through. Help us to hear what you want us to hear. But God, help us not just to hear. Because as we learned last week, if we're listening, we're obeying. Shema, that Hebrew word that has both of those meanings in it. We're here today to listen, but we're also here to obey. Because when we obey, God, we give you glory and we're blessed. So, Lord, speak and help us, Lord, to do the things you've put in our heart to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, brother. I love you, brother. Love you. Morning, church. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me. Oh, come on, church. I was glad when they said unto me. Let us go into the house of the Lord. Have you heard that song? Say it with me one more time. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's something I hope that you will never again take for granted. After everything that we experienced last year, when we couldn't do what we're doing this morning, I hope that this is more than just checking a box for you or going through a motion. I hope that you've come today to worship in spirit and in truth, to commune with holy God and allow him to radically change our heart to be made more in his image, for him to do surgery in our hearts, dividing between soul and spirit with his holy word so that he can cut out all that's not pleasing and build in everything that he wants to draw from us, through us, 
to accomplish his mission and his purpose. Are you ready to do that this morning, church? Thank you, praise team and worship team, for leading us. I know I was able to worship today because of your ministry. And uh, what a blessing that that was and always is. I love our pastor. Do you? Amen. And I, uh, that can be wrote too, but I, I want to tell you that, that this church, I, I get to travel. When I'm not here on Sundays, I'm serving sister churches in our network. And I can tell you that I've seen and been in many churches here and across the country and we are blessed that God has given us such a shepherd as Pastor Rim and Pastor Art and Pastor Ronnie. And I hope that you will continue to, to pray for them, to walk with them, to serve with them, because they're not here to do the work of ministry, although they do that. They're here to prepare us all to do the work of ministry so that together we can do it side by side. So I hope as, you, as there are opportunities to serve, just like driving a bus, my brother, and, and, and taking, taking kids to go and, and hear the gospel. And I understand that there are some children that are now a part of the family of God because a brother drove a school bus, and, and there were people and volunteers that went to work, and, and there were people there to teach. And it was all used by God to bring precious souls into the family of God. See how that works? It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Take your Bible, if you will. Turn with me to Ephesians, the third chapter this morning. Ephesians, the third chapter. I want you to take out a, a writing instrument and something to write on, whether it's an electronic device or a piece of paper. And then I want you to put your seatbelt on. A few weeks ago, I was here and I preached out of Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to back up and preach out of Ephesians 3 today. Kind of a prequel, if you will. <clears throat> when I was here last, we talked about, if you remember, walking in holiness. Do you remember that? That in and of itself is a call of God. But I hope that maybe God is doing something today to help us to understand why we're to walk in holiness, not just to please him and fulfill his, his purposes, for us to reflect his glory. But when we walk in holiness, as we talked about a few weeks ago, we can do better what we're going to talk about today. And that is proclaiming the glorious mystery of Christ. Proclaiming the glorious mystery of Christ. I want to jump in and just begin to read. Chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 14, and then we'll dive in in the deep end of the pool today with the help of the Lord. Paul says this, verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, understand, enter parenthesis, open parenthesis, verse 2. Assuming you have heard about the administration of God's grace that he gave me for you. The mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have briefly written above, speaking about previous writing in this letter. Verse 4. By reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. This was not made, made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. If you're one to underline your Bible or highlight, I want you to circle and highlight and underline and make large verse 6. Listen. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. 
Verse 8. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden, there's that mystery again, the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities, where? In the heavens. This is according to his eternal purpose, accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In him, we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So then, I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Pray with me. God, how great you are and worthy of our praise. There is nothing, no one, no thing that is greater than you. Father, we come before you today humbly. As Isaiah came into your throne room and saw you high and exalted with the train of your robe filling the temple, the smoke from the altar filling the room, God, we come into your awesome holy presence in this moment. And we pray that because we come before you, like Isaiah, that we would be humble. That we'd have open minds and open hearts to hear and to receive all you have for us. As in Isaiah's case, God, I pray that you would perform surgery in our lives. Father, reveal our sin to us. Call us to confession and repentance. Father, so that we may receive the forgiveness that is ours in Christ Jesus. To be made holy, not only in our position, but in our practice. Oh God, have your will in our life in this hour as we look into your word. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. And give us the faith to respond to your commands with obedience, with bold obedience. There is so much rich truth in this passage. Help this preacher to get out of the way so that you can give us what you would have us to know from your word today. We look to you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ephesians is, is fast becoming my most recent favorite book in the Bible. I got 66 of them. How about you? I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years in Ephesians studying and studying and studying, and, and it's been life-transforming for me. And my heart is racing this morning because of the deep, rich truths of the gospel that are in this passage. Anybody like me that sometimes your mind just races so fast that it gets ahead of your mouth? Anybody else? Sometimes that gets you in trouble. All the time. Be careful. Well, Paul 
when he wrote his letters to the churches. On some of those occasions, he didn't write with his own hand what God was giving to him, but rather God was giving to him his word, and he dictated that to a scribe. We see that referenced in Paul's letters to the churches in several occasions. And this was one of those occasions. You see, Paul was in jail for preaching the good news of the gospel. He referenced that in the latter part in verse 13 of this passage today. And I, I can just so relate with Paul in this moment because he starts this thought in verse 1. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, and at that moment, a rabbit appeared. And he turned and looked at that rabbit, and doggone it, he chased that rabbit a long ways. That's verses 2 through 13. And when he gets to the end of verse 13, he shoots the rabbit, and he comes back over here where he was, and he picks up in verse 14. Notice in verse 1, he says, for this reason... In verse 14, he gets back to his original thought, and he says again, for this reason I kneel before the Father. It's just a cool dynamic to look at those types of things and realize what's going on in the heart and mind as much as we can of Paul as he's being used as an instrument of God to receive his inspired word and record it for our benefit today. But Paul writes this run-on sentence, and he's talking, and boy, I can't imagine being the scribe. Because Paul's thoughts, thoughts are just racing. And I can just picture this scribe. Now, they didn't have, they didn't have uh, dictation machines like a court reporter uses. No. They didn't, have type, they, didn't have, they didn't have computers, laptops, anything like that. No. They didn't even have the old typewriters that we loathe anymore. They didn't even have, no. It was a scribe, not even with a ballpoint pen, mind you. No. It was a scribe with some type of quill or writing instrument on parchment with some type of ink and he was as fast as he could get ink on that quill and write on that parchment he was trying to keep up with Paul because Paul was racing in his mind to talk about all of these things that we're going to look at today his heart was so full he was just bubbling over have you ever been there in your devotional life, when God has just so poured out his spirit within you over what he's saying to you through his word, you just can't stand it. And, and it, you just can't withhold it all. And, and I must confess, I'm not much of a journaler. I, I'm a big picture guy, and my mind does race, and for me, journaling is making me sit down and be still and do something. And I, I, I lose the big picture because i got to sit down and i got to... Paul was just bubbling over with everything God was telling him. I had a conversation with a pastor this week. He referenced a time in recent past, actually a time in his previous, pre previous period in his life, when he was talking about how God was just speaking loudly in his life. Let me ask you the question I had him ask him. Have you ever had God moments like that in your life? When you were so overwhelmed and overcome by the very person and presence of God within you. He was humbling you. He was breaking you. He was rooting out all the sin in your life and calling you closer to him, making you more like him, and calling you to do things in his mission in partnership with him. Have you been there? Those experiences ought not to be rare. But to our detriment, so many times they are. And my only plea to you in this moment, in this point in the message, is simply this. Make sure that you're abiding in Jesus. Make sure you're meditating on his word. Because in this world, truth is being pitched out and nobody holds to absolutes anymore. And this world is messed up, and it's upside down. And its logic does not stand the test of measuring up to the plumb line of the truth of God's word. 
Do you want to stay right-minded in this world? Meditate in his word. That's all extra. That's not even in the message today. So, let me hasten, because we've got a lot to cover here. In verse 1, Paul says, for this reason. Now, having discussed in chapter 2, so if you, we're not going to take time to do it today, but sometime this week, write this down. Read chapter 2, verses 11 through the end of the chapter. And you're going to see God revealed through Paul to you and I God's perfect design for his body, the body of Christ, the church, and the makeup of that body. And he said, for this reason, having discussed this union of Jewish and Gentile believers in the church in verses 11 through 22 of chapter 2, Paul was about to offer a prayer on behalf of these believers that he's writing to. But he stopped right in the middle of a sentence at the end of verse 1. And he revisited the subject of the mystery of Christ revealed or unveiled in chapter 2. He explained this mystery and his responsibility to dispense it. And then in verse 14, he gets right back to the prayer he was going to pray for these believers to whom he's writing. And you want to read an awesome prayer. Jump into chapter 3, verse 14 to the end of that chapter. You hear an amazing prayer on the part of Paul for those he's pouring his life into. That's another sermon for another day. Paul then says in verse 1, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Now, Paul was in prison in Rome when he wrote the book of Ephesians. He did not consider himself, however, to be a prisoner of Rome. Catch this. It's all about your mentality. Are you struggling today? Have you gone through difficulties in your life? Well, Paul certainly was. He was a prisoner of Rome. But he didn't consider himself a prisoner of Rome. Listen. He considered himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Because it was out of obedience to Jesus that he was a prisoner there. And he trusted completely in the sovereignty of God. Even when life doesn't make sense, you can trust God. Especially when life doesn't make sense. You can trust God. He's trustworthy, friend. He's never let you down, nor will he ever. He considered his circumstances to be in the will of God so that the gospel could be spread to the Gentiles. There was a purpose in his suffering. And he got plugged into the purpose, and it gave him great contentment in going through what it was he was going through. Therefore, he considered himself a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles. It's all in how you look at it. Are you with me, church? It'll help you, I promise Corey Ten Boom, that's not a name we talk about a lot anymore. Corey Ten Boom was one of two sisters that was put into a concentration camp as Jewish sisters. And they suffered much for the sake of the gospel because they lived the gospel in that environment. And Corey's sister died in that concentration camp and she got a front row seat to all of her suffering. Corey Ten Boom wrote that she considered that whatever she was, wherever she was, That was just the part of the world that God wanted her to take the gospel to. Listen to that again. That wherever she was, that that was just the part of the world that God wanted her to take the gospel to. Even the German concentration camps. And that was Paul's perspective too. That'll change you. It'll help us not to get so down on ourselves or to get so frustrated or mad. It'll give us the contentment and the why when we're shaking our fist and and our finger at God to say, but God, why? I was doing this, but God, why? Well, it's because God in his sovereignty and his providence has a perfect plan and you and I aren't always privy to it. 
And for you and me, in that moment, it has to be enough to trust him by faith. Are you with me, church? All right. That's just the introduction. Somebody laugh. Because now we're going to get into the heart of this message today. Proclaiming the glorious mystery of Christ. I'm telling you, there's so much packed here. I'm not going to unpack it all. But there are things that God wants us to hear today. Verses 2 through 7 describe the close link between Paul's responsibility of the task God had given him and the mystery that God had revealed to him. And Paul describes this link in three different phases. So we're going to go through these three phases here in this next section. We're talking about the mystery here of the church. The mystery of the church is what I want us to look at first, actually in verses 2 through 6. So we're going to look first at the administration of grace. I want you to notice back in the passage, if your Bible's still open, I want you to notice Paul said in verse 2, he said, the administration of God's grace that was given to me. He also said the mystery was made known to me in verse 3. In verse 7, he said the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. And in verse 8 again, he says this grace was given to me, the least of all saints, why? To proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. And so I want us to look here first at the administration of grace. Administration here carries with it the sense or the idea of stewardship or a trust that is to be dispensed. So another perspective thing, a helpful hint for you today for personal application. Paul recognized that the grace that God gave him, that really everything was by grace. He realized and practiced that. But he also realized the grace that God gave him was not for his own personal enjoyment. No, this grace that God gave him was the grace of stewarding the gospel. Oh, gosh, church. Paul recognized that the gospel was the sole answer to man's deepest issue, the issue of sin, the good news of Jesus, and he was proclaiming here that God has given me the grace to be the steward of the gospel, and now he's telling me to go proclaim it. And he's telling me to go proclaim it to a people in a place. And in lots of places, if you read through all three missionary journeys of Paul in the book of Acts, the grace given to him was to be the steward of what God had entrusted to him. What did Jesus say? He said, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely. Oh, come on, church, help me. Jesus said, freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely, give. God gives us what he gives us not for our own benefit or satisfaction or pleasure. He gives us what he gives us to be used for his glory. For his purposes to accomplish his mission. Life is not about you and me. God does not revolve around our desires and wishes. No, we are here for the purposes and the plan and the providence of God. And Paul had that perspective. He realized God had given him the gracious gift of being the steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This grace was unmerited favor. Paul didn't deserve that. It was God's riches at Christ's expense. God, by his grace, gave Paul a privileged opportunity. And the grace was given to Paul. Why? So that he might pass it on to the Gentiles. So application point for you today if you're taking notes. Take an inventory of all that God has given you. Write it down on the ledger sheet. By the way, get a legal pad because it's going to be long. Are you with me? Get a legal pad. Take an inventory of all that God has given you. And when you get to the end of it all, which I doubt you'll exhaust it all, you'll get tired of writing. Then pray and say, God, I realize you've given this to me not for my personal satisfaction and pleasure. You've given me every bit of this so that I can use it for you and to bless others with it. Amen? That will be life trip. When you get there, It'll transform your whole reason for waking up in the morning. Are you with me? 
the administration of grace. We have to we have to rush on. Secondly, I want us to see the revelation of the mystery. Oh, this is oh this is this is huge. What is this mystery? So Paul talks a lot about this mystery that he references here in chapter 3 and verse 6. He references it in other places, and we're going to look at those. When I was at Washington Bible College back in the day, before I had even met Ann, and she, before she came to the college, I was two years ahead of her, I sat in a theology class with a professor by the name of Harry Fowler, Dr. Harry Fowler. He was a peculiar sort of man. Had very interesting ways. But he taught in ways that help you to remember the things that he was teaching you. And here's what he told me about this mystery that I remember to this day. Anybody like to watch mystery shows on TV? Anne loves mystery shows. She's just, she's just the queen of mystery shows. I'm, I'm telling you, mystery books. These, these aren't crime mysteries or anything like that. No, this is glorious. Dr. Fowler said to us, a mystery is a sacred, hidden secret, hitherto concealed, hidden in ages past, but now revealed. Ta-da! <laughs> did, did you catch that? I can't remember things from a minute ago, but I can remember things from 30 years ago. Anybody else got that problem? Mystery. Mystery is simply a truth not previously known. To reveal is to uncover or to unveil something that has previously been covered or hidden. Paul's references to the mysteries of God. Again, just write these references down, make these your devotions this week. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 1, 9. He said, he made known to us the mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure that he purposed in us. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4, we've read that already. Let's, for the sake of time, keep on rolling. Actually, let me go back and read that because we're getting ready to make a really big point here. Will you allow me to do that? Thank you. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4. The mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have briefly written above. He's talking about what he wrote in chapter 2. By reading this, you're able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So Paul's saying, I'm pouring out my heart here. By the God has given me this, I'm giving it to you, and by you reading it, you're getting inside my heart and mind. You can understand this mystery of Christ. And then in verse 6, this is the crux of it all. This is huge news. I hope you've unplugged from all the news stuff because it'll just, it'll just poison your mind. But you know all those breaking news alerts and all that stuff? There is no breaking news bigger than this. Well, there is breaking news bigger than this, and that is that Jesus saves. But here's his plan for that salvation. So follow me here. Ephesians 3, 6. The Gentiles are co-heirs. Say co-heirs. They're co-heirs. Say members. They are members of the same body. And they are partners. Say partners. They are partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Back in the Old Testament, God called Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great person, a great man in my economy, in my, in my plan. And from you is going to come more people than people can count more than the sand on the sea and the stars in the sky. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your generation and the generations that follow after you. And he, he chose Israel to be his own. But like you and me, Israel got it wrong. You know how they got it wrong? They thought that God's selection for them, of them, was for their benefit. And that's where they missed the boat. They got to thinking, oh, they got proud. They said, I must be pretty sharp. Me. God chose, he didn't choose you, he chose me. That was so deeply entrenched in a Jewish worldview that when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel, he said, I will not. 
I will not go to that city and preach to those sinful people because they might hear it and believe and they might be included, and so I'm not going to go there. And he wagged his finger in the face of God. He got in a boat and went the opposite direction. Oh, friend, but God had a different plan. Yeah, he had a fish prepared. And that fish had God's GPS. You know where that fish swam? All the way to Nineveh, where God told him to go in the beginning. See, Jonah got in the boat, and he went in the opposite direction. God's plans will always prevail for his glory, for his purpose, because he is God and we are not. The Gentiles missed it. I mean, the, the, the Jews missed it. Again, another example. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, he had to go north, and to go north, he had to go through Samaria. Now, Jews, they didn't go through Samaria. They went way, way, way around it so they wouldn't have to go through Samaria because they didn't want to mess with those dirty Samaritans. They were half-breeds. They were half-Jew and half-Gentile. They were dirty. They were less than them. I'm not going to bother with those dirty Samaritans. But did Jesus do that? No. Jesus went right to the middle of the city, sat down at the well in the middle of that city, and he talked to a woman, a man talking to a woman, a Samaritan woman, who had questionable morals. I mean, Jesus broke down every barrier to take the gospel there. The Jews missed it. God chose them so that they could be a blessing to all, not just so that the Son of God could be born through that line, but so that they could proclaim the good news of Jesus to all nations, to all peoples. Are you with me, church? Revelation chapter 7 reveals the end of God's plan. It's not the end of time, but it's his plan revealed. If you look at Revelation chapter 7, we get to look through the eyes of John, as God has given him this vision of eternity, and John looks out and sees a crowd so big that no one can count. Sound familiar? <clears throat> and this, the makeup of this crowd, the demography of this crowd, was they were made up of every nation, people, tribe, and language. And I want to tell you, my friend, that was not a plan B for God. God, from the beginning, wanted diversity among his people to reflect the diversity of who he is. Are you with me, church? Oh, my goodness. And this mystery was not that the Gentiles would be saved, for the Old Testament gave evidence of that. But rather that believing Jews and Gentiles would be joined together and would share in the blessings of the promised Messiah. That was a revolutionary revolution. Revol uh, revolutionary concept for the Jews and Gentiles alike. Ephesians 6, 9, Paul said, Pray for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Colossians 1, 27, Paul says, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul said in Colossians 2, 2, he says, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, who is Christ Jesus. Paul says, Colossians 4, 3 and 4, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. To which we all should say, and so should we. Amen? Oh, church. God is sovereign. Brother, praying for you as you go preach this morning. Thank you so much for coming to worship with us. Oh, church, this is huge. I hope 
that you'll get so infected with this vision that you'll never see the body of Christ the same again. And that you will have this longing within you to see the body of Christ as diverse on earth as it will be in heaven. Are you with me, church? If we settle for anything less than that, we are not keeping in step with the mind and the plan and the purposes of God. Oh, church, are you with me? Oh, it's getting quiet. God has brought us all together in Jesus. Well, let's hasten on. We've looked at We've looked at this mystery of the church. I want us to look at the ministry of the gospel. Found in verses 7 to 12. Paul said in verse 7, he, he, said, he said that he was made a servant of this gospel. Let's go back and read it together again, starting in verse 7. He said, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. Let's continue through verse 12. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim the, to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ and to shed light for all about the administration of this mystery hidden for ages uh, in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom, we're going to talk about that in a minute, may now be made known, now be made known through the church. Us, that's you and me, to the rulers and authorities where? That seems a little bit odd, in heaven. But there's something cool there. This is according to his eternal purposes, accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him we have the boldness and the confident access through faith in him. Oh gosh, I get excited every time I read it. Help us, Lord. The, mist, the ministry of the gospel. I want us to see this. So we've seen the mystery. You understand now what the mystery is. It's no longer a mystery. God has pulled back the veil and he's revealed to us his mystery that he's created us all in his image to be united into his body made possible through his son. But now there's this ministry of the gospel to which we're called. Paul said that he was made a servant of it. This word servant stresses not the idea of subjection, as does the word doulos or slave, but the idea rather of service and serving as one who is a waiter. So Paul says, I have been called to be a waiter to serve others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's service was initiated by the gift of God's grace, and it continues by the working of his power. You say to me, preacher, that's you and not me. I can't preach like you preach. You don't understand. I can't remember things too good. When somebody asks me a question, I lock up. And so I, I'd rather leave all that preaching and witnessing stuff to you. I'll stay back here and I'll pray for you. In fact, I'll like, how much do you need? You, you, we pull out a checkbook. I'll stroke a check. And I'll make it possible for you to go. I'll sit back here and hold the rope. But friend, that's not God's design. God has called all of us to be his mouthpiece, to be, to be stewards, to give away everything that God has given to us. To serve as a waiter. Listen to Paul's feeling. So you think you feel unworthy of that? Well, so did Paul. Paul's feelings of unworthiness are seen in the first part of verse 8 where he talks about being the least. He also mentioned that a few other times. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Paul talks about being the least of the apostles. Ephesians 3, 8 talks about being less than the least of God's people. If the least of God's people here, then Paul said, I'm here. 1 Timothy 1, 15, he says, I'm the worst of sinners. These were not statements of false humility in relation to other people. Oh, don't miss that. These are not statements of false humility saying, oh, they're better than I am. No, had nothing to do with that at all. These were statements of Paul's understanding of his shortcomings in relationship to Jesus Christ. So Paul, he recognized the immensity of the grace of God, the immensity of the good news of Jesus, that it is the cure for all of mankind, 
and I have been given the responsibility to take this great gift that will solve everybody's deepest need and to proclaim it to everyone that is greater than I can shoulder. God help me. And he felt very humble by that because he recognized the immensity of it all, but recognized that the grace of God was given to him to do this, and the power of God was resident within him to carry it out, just as it is in you and me. You think I'm doing this this morning in my own power? Oh, I promise you I'm not. I promise you I'm not. Sometimes I sit down after I'm preaching, Pastor Randy, I'm sure you do too. I sit and I say, where did that come from? I promise you. Randy, you have those moments too? And it's God speaking through us. To, when, we, when we make ourselves available to him, he uses us for his purposes, for his glory, to advance his kingdom, to advance his mission, to proclaim the good news of Jesus so people can become followers of Jesus. And we fulfill his commandment to go and make disciples. It's beyond my ability. And it's beyond yours. But we have the Holy Spirit within us. Jesus said, I will give you the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, you will receive power. And when you receive power, you will be my... Oh, help me, church. He says, you will be be my, say witnesses, witnesses, first at home and then to the ends of the world. Amen? We've got an amazing job to do that's far bigger than me or you or all of us together. In fact, you take every believer, every follower of Jesus on the face of the planet right in this moment, and it's bigger than all of us. Apart from God working in us. I'll, I'll never forget. I was saved at nine, called to ministry at 15, prepared for ministry. God gave me my ministry partner and my spouse. And we went out together to serve the Lord. And, and uh, I, I had no idea what God was going to do, and neither do you. My assumptions were blown out of the water as he gave me job after job and place in place and task in task. Along that journey, one of those tasks was to be the point person for Southern Baptists, who at the time were about 45,000 churches strong, 16 million members strong. And my job was to be their sole response, the sole representative to coordinate all of our outreach for Native American evangelism and church planting and church health throughout North America. What in the world? What in the world? At the time, 5 million Native American people throughout all of North America. 5 million. Chose me? They're, they're, they're tribes that have 300,000 members. I come from a tribe that has less than 500. I'm not, in the places, I'm not out in the places where you think about all the Indian country. No, I'm from Virginia. And I was able to look at Paul and, and identify with that to say, I get it. I'm unworthy. But we all are. The moment we think that we're capable, the moment we think that we're able enough in our own strength to pull off God's work, we're done before we ever start. Because on our best day, our best deeds are but filthy rags in the eyes of God, and nothing we do by our own strength can have any impact in eternity whatsoever. But with God, all things are possible. Our church. Paul had a twofold ministry to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable, incalculable riches of Christ. Christ's fathomless spiritual wealth can never be fully comprehended. This word translated unsearchable here literally means not capable of being traced by footprints. He was given the job to make that known to everybody. And then to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. That was his job. And that's our job. I must hasten. 
before I do, Paul was compelled by that. If you read another of Paul's writings, he talks about being compelled within with this realization that drove him to do everything that he did. Some people might say that Paul had a death wish because he wanted to go to Rome and defend the gospel. And everybody kept on telling him along the way as we look back in retrospect now and say, what was he thinking? Didn't he know that was a suicide mission? No, for him that was the pinnacle of pre preaching Jesus at the center of power for all of the world at that time. He was going to go there and proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. He was compelled. He couldn't help, but every morning when, he eyes, when his eyes woke, his, his head lifted off that pillow, not a pillow that was comfortable as yours or mine, but when his head lifted off that pillow in the morning, everything within him drove him to be a minister of the gospel, a slave of it. As it should you and me. You're looking for a life purpose? Try that one on. Because you're called to that. The mind and wisdom of God. We're going to hasten here. We're going to run. We're going to sprint to the end. But I don't, want to, I don't want you to miss these things. Verse 10. When Paul says in verse 10. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may be. Uh, may now. Circle now. Be made known through the church. To the rulers and authorities in heaven. In classic Greek. The word manifold here referred to the beauty of an embroidered pattern. Any sewers in the room? Anybody like to sew and embroider? Paul is talking, when he talks about the multifaceted wisdom of God, he's talking about a beautiful tapestry. So in Native American life, <clears throat> back in the Southwest, if you've ever been over to Navajo country, they, they weave rugs there. And they'll take, they'll, they'll take fabric and, and, and thread and all kinds of things and get this big loom and they, they take thread and run it this way and they run it that way and they run it this way and they run it this way and, and, and by the time they're all done they got knots and all kinds of things but when you look at the other side oh there's a beautiful tapestry that doesn't hold a candle to the, multi, to the manifold wisdom of God that he's making known in this mystery The multifaceted wisdom of God refers to the unity and relationships between believing Jews and Gentiles in one body. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 12 says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. Verse 12, these things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Spirit sent from heaven. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. Listen to this. The body of Christ today, that's you and me, made up of both Jews and Gentiles, we're in that tribe, and one body redeemed by the grace of God is a vivid display or a manifestation to even, listen, we today are a display even to the rulers, authorities, principalities, powers, in the heavenly realms of the wisdom and grace of God. Spiritual beings from the beginning of time wanted to know this mystery. Spiritual beings from the beginning wanted to know this mystery. And it was kept a mystery from them. And they're not participants in this mystery. They're observers of it. No. You and I we're participants in it. We're part of that fabric that's woven through making this beautiful body, this multifaceted, diverse body of Christ made up of people from every nation, language, tribe, and tongue. Oh, church. Do you understand how special that is? Spiritual beings wanted to see this, and God chose you and me not only to reveal it to, but said you're a part of it. And they just have to sit in the, in the sidelines and watch it. And because they watch it and they see the grace of God on display, then they turn right back around and praise our God. Amen? Because we're trophies of his grace. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Well, what is the effect of the gospel? For it's found in Ephesians 3.12. In him we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. 
Writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore let us approach the throne of grace with, say boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Hebrews 10, 19 to 23 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10.35, so don't throw away your confidence which has a great reward. We've talked about the mystery of the church. We've talked about the, the ministry of the gospel. We've seen the manifold wisdom of God. But here, I want you to understand that because we are recipients of the gospel, because we've been transformed by the gospel, you and I have this boldness and confident access. And it's all because of Jesus. Friend, you've been made with a purpose to reflect the image of God or created in his image and to advance the mission of God, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, making disciples of all nations. That's your purpose. And if you're not plugged into that purpose, I would dare bet that you're probably feeling a little unsettled. Because when you take something that was created for a purpose and keep it out of that purpose and divert it into something different, it just doesn't work. You can pretend for a while, but it has devastating effects. Your purpose radiate his glory, radiate his, his, his image, reflect it into advance his mission. Purpose of the church is to re reflect God as well. In all of its diversity. And we need to be running every day to do that hard as you can. Paul said in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, he said he spared no effort so that by all possible means through the proclamation of the gospel that he, God was making possible through him that some would be saved. He let that drive every ounce of his being. And because the gospel has taken root in you, you've got everything you need to do all of that. You've got an enemy that's sworn to your destruction, mind you. He's going to fill your head with lies. He's going to lie to you about who you are and what you're capable of. He's going to lie to you about the effects of your past and that it's, the, the stains won't come out, the stains of sin and guilt, that they won't come out. Oh, no. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, he tells you lies. Oh, but in Jesus, we have it all. And he wants to accomplish his purpose and plan through you. And through me. So, what does all that mean for you and me today? Paul said, I don't want you to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf. For therefore your glory. If Paul had not been dispensed to the Gentiles to steward uh, the stewardship of God's grace, then Jews would not have been hostile to him and he would not have been in prison. 
His preaching brought salvation to the Gentiles, but it incurred the wrath of many Jews on him. However, many others became members of the church, Christ's body, and this was their glory. So how have you personally embraced how have we as a church and how have we as individual members of it embraced the multicultural, multiracial makeup of the body of Christ? We need to embrace that. We need to be so deep in that that we don't see anything different. And we need to let, it, let that drive us to go to people that aren't like us. We have to be intentional about that because it's not going to happen by accident. We have to do what Jesus did and break all the barriers, break all the molds, and put ourselves in the middle of places that aren't like home to reach every person. We cannot be satisfied with less than that. Or will you pray that God will give you a drive to see people reached with the gospel? I, I would just, a personal appeal, I'd ask you to pray for Ann and I and for Mike and Susan Hurst, for, for her mom, we're getting ready to, to leave two weeks from this past Friday, and we're going to head off to go to Minnesota and Montana. And we're going to go there to be able to proclaim the gospel among First Nations, Native American people and those who work with them so that they can make more disciples and plant more churches in Native American communities all over North America. We're going to do that in, in Minnesota, and then when we get to Montana, we're going to be on two reservations. We're going to be on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, then we're going to be on the Rocky Boy Reservation, dealing with, with members of multiple tribes in those two reservation settings, helping them to understand everything we've talked about today, the mystery of the gospel. And God is compelling us to go. And all I know to do is to go. Will you pray for us? And I want you to let me know how I can pray for you in crossing barriers. Ethnically, racially, language, culture, economic, geographic. We need to be crossing barriers and borders and boundaries to take the gospel to everyone. And I challenge you with everything within me today. I beseech you, my brothers and sisters. Let God administer his grace, the grace of the mystery of the gospel through you to bring people that are not like you to faith in Jesus so that we can reflect here what we will be in glory. Will you commit yourself to that? How are you working to further the multicultural, multiracial makeup of the body of Christ? With whom have you shared the mystery of the gospel lately? And to whom is God calling you to carry the gospel Jesus said that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. God help us in this moment. God help us to embrace your challenge, your call, your purpose. God, we cast down our idols for there is no one, nothing, no one that's better than you. We have been saved and transformed and are being sanctified because of the blood of Jesus. Oh God, you've already called us and commissioned us God, you've even equipped us by giving us your spirit within us. What you want from us is our obedience. So God, help us this week to be obedient to administer the grace of the gospel of Jesus to every man, woman, boy, and girl that we cross paths with this week. God, help us to be faithful stewards of this gospel that you've entrusted to us. Help us to run to the highways and the hedges, compelling others to hear the good news of Jesus. God, help us all to find that you've gone before us and created divine appointments and opportunities for us to share. 
And in that moment, God, I know that the enemy is going to creep in and make us fearful and cower. Oh, but God, in that moment, help us to have bold assurance and confidence that you've called us to proclaim the good news of Jesus and that you would empower us as we do it. God, with eager expectation and faith, we trust you to allow us to bring the sheaves of the harvest into the storehouse. God, will you start a revival in this church to revive our hearts to understanding who you are and what you want us to do? And through that revival, God, would you create an awakening in Smithfield and in Carrollton and in Isle of Wight and in all of the South Side and all of Hampton Roads? Everywhere you send us around the globe, Will you start an awakening of people coming to you because of our obedience to you and your word to us this morning in this room? You are able. We trust you. We give our lives to you to that extent. Do it through us, God. God, I'm also keenly aware in this moment that there's somebody in this room right now that themselves has not trusted you to be their Savior and their Lord. They're still carrying the weight of their sins on their back, and they're filled with grief and guilt that's too heavy to bear. And Jesus, in this moment, invite them into your presence. Help them to not walk, but to run into your arms. Give them the faith to believe the good news that you save and forgive and restore and redeem. Save their soul today. Help them to pray, God, I am a sinner. And I confess my sins to you. And I trust in your ability to save me that you paid the price for my sins to make me whole in the eyes of God, to come live within my heart and to follow you all the days of my life. God, I pray that right now in this room that there is someone who prayed that prayer. Help us as a church to rally around them and help us, God, as a church to see many more like them in the days, weeks, months, years ahead. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise team is here. They're going to sing. I'd invite you to stand, and I want you to respond to God in whatever he's asked of you. I hope that your answer today will be yes. Yes, God, here am I. Use me. Send me. Pastor Randy's going to come and stand here and receive you. If you need prayer, I know that he'd be eager to pray with you. You can make this these steps your altar, and you commune with God and make any commitment you need to before him. Thank you for allowing me to preach God's word today. Once 
So be aware of that. We will be having Sunday school here in just a few minutes. So pray that you'll stick around for our Bible study. And uh, we'll see you in Bible study. And good looking group this morning. Glad that you're here.
Nothing.